problem with science fiction. Hello, it, it is. It. Yeah. yeah. I, I just finished. We I will be presenting uh, the second half of the Lords of Iron script this evening. And uh, let's see. Is this guy hopefully... No, no, no. Da, 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 da. That, okay, cool. All right, yeah. Um, I'll be I'll be presenting the second half of the the Lords of Iron script this evening, and yeah, the sci-fi uh, is hard to write. I discovered um, <laughs> like, it's it's very demanding. Well, at least uh, the You're being way, an question. Yeah, the way I had decided to to write it, which was like I want like hard sci-fi. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it would be like easy if I was just gonna write like okay uh, Star Trek or Star Wars ish, because I'm just like okay what, what what tropes exist in that universe I'm just gonna use them. But here yeah. I was like, but how would they how would they live on Ceres? It's only 500 miles in diameter, hmm. you know. So I, I had to work out all this stuff. So uh, that, that took way longer than expected. But Danny Danny seemed to to like. The result, and I we like got it added some unnecessary complication to the art direction, right? That is ultimately going to uh, improve the the quality of the project. Okay. And currently, is a giant hassle. <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, let's see. Good God, Doc! Always shutting. All right. Well, let's take a look. We got not the Demonatrix today, so. Yeah, I, I felt like you guys needed a break. Okay. Uh, this is this is something I've been working on, and there's quite literally only 16 pages of it because I quite have no idea where I'm. Holy crap! I was just pouring myself a cup of tea, and there's a spider in my cup. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, while I spider cup. Spider cup. Extra spider. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, so there's only 16 pages, and I have no idea what I'm doing on page three, right. where I'm going from there. So I figured I'll bring it and let you guys. Uh, Get your thoughts and see if it gives me some ideas on where I want to go with it. Okay. All right. Cool. Hmm. Uh, exterior China, the Dragon Warrior. Okay. So, uh, what, what, what's what's the conflict that's, that's moving us along here? What, what do you think? Introduce us. What have we got? You, Danny, introduce. Or you want me to introduce? I, uh, you, you, John. It's your. Oh, or, no, this you, this you, is yours, right? This is yours. Yes, this is mine. Yes, you said Danny, yours. introduce us. Oh, no, oh. you, John, introduced. So us, apparently, uh, once upon a time in China, uh, there, there arose go. a great yes. evil. And oh, uh, okay. this is about a dragon who becomes a warrior in order to fight that evil. There you that's go. Good Actually, that's pretty, pretty dog. I was about to say, I think that's probably <laughs> what we got. Okay. Uh, who's um, who's who's yeah. <laughs> so um, let's see. Who, who who wants to do a lot of reading? There's, there's a lot of uh, narration. Okay. Uh, myself on the hook for <laughs> yeah. so I'm passing on this one. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, all right, I'll narrate. Whatever. Um, okay. Danny, why don't you do Shang since you're already starting okay. that one? Okay. And um, let's see, uh, Larry, you want to do um, Julia? Sure. And then, and then who else is there? There's a there's several people that have a couple of lines, and then. Um, uh, Preston, why don't you do uh, Lang? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can oh, you can do my Russian guy too. You can be Dimitrov because I don't think they have any lines together. All okay. right, we'll figure out the rest as we go. All right, mm. all right. Exterior, Exterior China. 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 <laughs> nice. Moving. Somewhere in China. <laughs> A fast-paced and stylized animation panning across the Chinese landscape over mountains and lush forests. Then we see the Chinese imperial city. Once upon a time, in ancient China, there arose a great evil. <laughs> a stylized animated army rises from the ground, marching toward the imperial city. Fast zoom to the imperial city gates. An army charges from the city to meet the opposition in bladed combat. After a year's siege of the Imperial City, the Emperor's son led the castle guards in a final assault. The Imperial guards are cut down left and right. A javelin flies, piercing the prince's armor. The Emperor's son was gravely wounded. The prince drops to his knees, pulls the bloody spear from his stomach. Looking up, he raises a bloody hand to the heavens. 
he called out to the gods to deliver his enemy into their hands. Now, the emperor had always been a just and pious man and taught his sons to be the same. So the gods headed his cry. He did his two yeah. The emperor's son rises to his feet. Golden dragon scales grow over his armor as they grow over his as they grow over his helmet, it changes shape to the head and face of a dragon. The spirit of the dragon came upon the prince. The prince charges at the enemy with his spear and sword, cutting down the enemy. He is unstoppable. With sword and spear, the dragon warrior fought back the invading empire. Interior, warehouse, office, night. Uh, Julia, seven, lays out on a cot listening as her father... Uh, Hu Su Shang reads from a children's storybook. The cover is in Chinese, but the image features the stylized rendering of the emperor's son in his dragon armor. And for a thousand years after, peace ruled the land, and no one dared to stand against the gods. Again, again. Shang kisses Julia on the forehead, tucking her in. Not tonight, little one. Get some sleep. He turns down the gas lamp hanging from the ceiling before exiting and closing the door. Interior warehouse. Several Russian gangsters sit on the main floor playing poker and drinking. Chang exits the upstairs office, walks down the steps. Dimitrov deals out some cards. Hmm. I, I thought for sure this was a period historical fantasy thing, but... I thought this wasn't the Demon Atrix. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I am Demon Atrix, all right? So I go, she sleep? I hope so. I have little girl, same age, good age, innocent. <laughs> yes, hopefully America can keep her innocence. We deal you, Chinaman? No, she she. <laughs> Come, we let you earn money, or we let you earn back some money you pay us. Chang walks to the bar, searches through the drawers. You, what you need? Tea? <laughs> I should add a line where he says, no tea, only vodka. There, there we go. you go. Bang! The garage door falls from the hinges as several 1920s cars, painted in black and white doors bearing the emblem of the Los Angeles Police Department, charge into the warehouse. Several officers open fire with Tommy guns onto the Russians before they are able to react. Dimitrov throws Shang to the ground, grabbing his pistol. He returns fire seconds before being shot to pieces. Captain Malcolm Hayward leads the charge, followed by two plainclothes detectives, Paul Johnson and Jacob Lang, and dozens of uniformed officers. Several more Russian thugs enter from the rear of the warehouse, leading to an intense gun battle. Shane crawls out across the floor, trying to stay out of sight as the intense gun battle rages. As the ringing of gunfire quiets, Shang lays still. The officers search the bodies. Jo Johnson notices Shang. Uh, Larry, why don't you do Johnson? He's got a couple lines coming up. Sure. Uh, Johnson pulls Shang to his knees by the collar. Captain, we got a China man. Uh, Lang, check upstairs. See if there's any more slants hanging about. Sir. Lang races up the stairs. Office. Lang kicks the door open, covering the room with his machine gun. He notices the shovel blankets on the cot. Warehouse floor. Hayward grabs a chair, sits across from Shang. Oh, he's got a couple lines. Somebody want to do uh, Hayward? You got papers? Chang oh, motions geez. to his pocket. Johnson pulls out the passport, hands it to Hayward. What brings you to my city, China man? I left you, G. That's why you hired Ruskies to smuggle you in, rather than go through Ellis? Johnson acts, say I not welcome. Who's lying? Oh, uh... Oh, I am. We're clear up here. Yeah. There's nobody upstairs. Good. Uh, Hayward stands, moves to the chair. No witnesses. Johnson draws a pistol, shoots Chang in the head, execution style. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't... I, I don't know how many different styles there are for shooting someone in the head, but all right. No. Which <laughs> one of you? <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> Which one of you two want to clean up duty? I'll take it. Hayward and Johnson shoot, shoot him a look. This mess is all yours. 
Hayward and Johnson, along with most of the uniformed officers, return to their vehicles and exit. Detective? Call the body wagon. As the officer walks to the phone, Lang exhales deeply. He glances up at the office. Fade to black. Superimpose, 15 years later. Exterior, Chinatown Street, day. Lang and William Clive, late 20s, early 30s, park on the side of the street where several uniformed officers have barricaded off an alleyway. Uh, a, a uniformed officer moves the barricade, allowing the two detectives to enter. Down the alley, Lang and Clive find the corpse of a naked young woman laying on the pavement. Several officers snap photographs. Uh, who wants to be uh, Clive? Son of a bitch. There we go. <laughs> Lang size. Has anyone called me or Hayward yet? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, Lang kneels down, examining the body, bruises and cut marks uh, on her body. A head wound leaks blood across the pavement. Any witnesses? The officer points to some Chinese pedestrians standing outside the police barricade. Any other witnesses? The officer shakes his head. Great. Lang stands up. I'll talk to them. Just finish up here and put a priority on that film. Across the street, Lang crosses the street. As he approaches the pedest- <laughs> as he approaches the pedestrians, he shows his badge. Detective Jacob Lang. Did anyone see what happens? Uh, the pedestrians exchange confused looks. A few speak Chinese to each other. Just, just, just FYI, there's no language called Chinese. Uh, anyone here speak English? I, I, okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. They would probably be speaking Mandarin. There you go. Um, more confused looks and Mandarin dialogue to each other. Clive crosses the street. Oh, I've got the film. Good. I've got nothing here. A bunch of slants want to move here. At least they could do is learn the language. Get in the car. Clive walks up to the pedestrians. Hey, what did you see? Yelling at them isn't going to teach them English. The pedestrians back up. An older woman darts her eyes away. Clive grabs her arm. Bill. She knows something. Lang puts his hand on Clive's shoulder. Let's go. Clive lets the woman go, gets into the police car. Sorry. Lang gets in the car, pulls away from the street. Interior, Captain Johnson's office, day. Paul Johnson, now the police captain, sits behind his desk looking at the photos. Lang and Clive stand across him from the desk. Any witnesses? None that speak English. Get on this case. I don't care what it takes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hallway outside Hayward's office. Lang and Clive exit the office. I bet we burned down the block. That'll knock their tongues loose. Uh, We could try learning their language. (laughs) They want in my country, they should learn. They should. My language. (laughs) I got to pick up my daughter from school. We'll get started on this first thing tomorrow. Exterior, Santa Monica, all girls school day. Lang parks out front of the school. Exiting the vehicle, he walks the sidewalk toward the building. A nun stands outside the school as Lang walks up the steps. Good evening, Mr. Lang. Evening. The doors open as several teen girls in uniforms race out. Jolly, did you see Megan? I think she's still in the gym with Julia. Julia? Our new PE teacher. Hallway. The nun leads Lang down a hallway. Julia's background is a bit different, so we thought bringing her on would benefit the girls to learn from someone of a different culture. Uh, Gymnasium. When the nun escorts Lang into the gym, they find Julia, now 22, leading a handful of the girls, including Megan, 14, in guided meditation. What's this? Just something she likes to do. It's completely voluntary and has no effect on their grade. Uh, Julia finishes the meditation, opening her eyes. She spots Lang and the nun standing by the door. Who's Julia? Dad. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. the gr- the girl, stand up, heading for the door. Dad. Go change, hon. Okay. <laughs> Megan turns to Julia and bows. Julia bows. Julia, this is Megan's dad. 
And Larry, I think you were Julia, weren't you? Uh, that policeman, nice to meet you. Sure. Uh, Julia and Lang shake hands. So where are you from? Shanghai, by the way of San Francisco. Parents immigrated when I was young. What bring you down this way? Decided to strike out on my own. Megan returns wearing her school uniform. Forgive me for being forward, but will you be willing to help me with the case? Dad, at least ask her over for dinner first. <laughs> no, no, I have this case in Chinatown. I need a translator. Do you have any time tomorrow? I'm free after 1 p.m. Good. I'll pick you up here and drop you off when I come get Megan. Sounds good. Interior police car. Lang and Megan get into the car. She's a little young, isn't she, Dad? <laughs> hey, I just need her help with the case. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> ten, ten pages. Yeah. That's, that's ten. As I said, there's only six more that I got that's so ten. far. So, All right. Uh, well, we had murder. Uh, and uh, and an and an investigation. Mm -hmm. We also had a big army and a dragon warrior and an emperor. So a lot of stuff going on. Um, I I believe that uh, this story has something to do with the Chinese. So you think so? There you go. Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Danny, what do you think? The dialogue's pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, the All of the scenes have clear action and direction in them. And there's, you got a pretty good idea of where you're going with this. I, 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 have, a, I have a handful of ideas. <laughs> okay. But no. Yeah. I mean, I, I could go into constructive if that's helpful, uh, or I'm happy. First, to Larry. Yes. Yes. Dialogue is pretty well written. Yes, I will agree with that. Um, yeah, the story is pretty interesting to you. Like, I like the juxtaposition, and I don't know if. Yeah, I, I kind of like the the changing timeline and stuff like that. That's that's kind of an interesting idea. For a beginning of a story, I could go into constructives too, but <laughs> constructives, yeah. go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah, it, it, might, yeah it might, it might be a bit rushed, but you know, that's all. Like it, it was, it jumps time periods really quickly, so we don't really get a sense of what's going on in each time period. It's just little snippet of events. So anyway, Danny, you can go since you um, wanted. It was unclear to me which time period it was. Yeah, uh, that's like it. it's not like everyone's like, oh, it's all these slants, see, or like you know <laughs> anything like that. Like, so it was randomly racist. It was feeling a little like the '40s, but yeah, you do need to put in the script. Like, yeah. what do the cars and streets look like? You know, give us some kind of clues. To... Yeah, that that would have been really helpful. Um, yeah. And then for the during the time jump, I got really confused because I thought Lang like. I mean, never mind that he just witnessed an execution. Like, you turn around 15 years later and he's defending these people, which, yeah. cool. I'm behind that, but also, what? And then all of a sudden, he's yes sir again at the end when he's got someone underneath him. It was like, um, it, it wasn't really clear to me what the time jump did, aside from make Julia happen. Mm. Um, but, like, this is within the context of, like, there's clearly something interesting going on, and mm -hmm. I now see why you had so much fun with the gang scenes in Demon Matrix. Why is uh, that? Cause, well, because he's clearly been working on that sort of thing for a while. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, but like, it was also a really weird juxtaposition to have a children's story and then weird gang internet gang stuff. <laughs> like, and why wasn't it just like internal Chinese gang stuff? Many questions. The script opens up more questions than it answers to me so far. Yeah. 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 Um, Preston, you have to start with uh, positives. I, I already said positives. Yeah, he did. You said there was they some really quick stuff. <laughs> nice try. 
All right. Um, <laughs> that was him trying. That was me trying. Well, <laughs> I'm hold it accountable. When Preston says I, your script was very well formatted, you know he's not. <laughs> All of the shots. What were he said was focused. basically one step above that. But this is uh, very yeah. rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, as I yeah. said, it's. it's I, I am. I was just. Figured I, I wanted to do something different and maybe get some ideas on where I where and how I want to develop this story. So okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I mean that leads to the obvious question uh, once Preston's done of what do you right. want to do with it, which you should answer after Preston says nice things and gives a crit. There you go. <laughs> um, well, I liked the 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 open there where we were in China and uh, mm. we had the warrior. And that was cool and felt like I was going to be tuning in for like Mulan or something. Uh, but mm. then we, 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 we jumped off that and then we had a gang, or at least what seemed like a gang. We had a Russian mobster and I guess a Chinese national. And I think they got murdered by people. Um, do we know who by killed an oppo- yeah, By an opposing gang masquerading as the police. Or ah, a gang okay. with badges. Okay. So right, yeah. I was the a little, the okay. police are basically a, a gang with badges. Okay. That's yeah. kind of what, what I'm where you, I'm going you, with that. I notice you like that. You you, you use that one <laughs> a few times. And, and and that's cool. Um so you know, I like that part too. So that that part is neat. Um in terms of what I, what I notice and like what, what I what I really want you to work on is what's the emotion of the various scenes because when when we open and we got all right so here's our China story uh, you know our, our China myth in essence um, mm-hmm. I'm not like emotionally attached to any of it you know there's there's things and there's this guy and he's got something and there he is and then we leave from him and then we got these people. And we got the Russian guy who's kind of involved with this other person and they're talking about playing poker and then these other people come in and kill them. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't know how I should feel about that. I'm like, okay. Um, interesting. And then we've got the cops and they're investigating and they're racist. And <laughs> then we got this one guy who's got a daughter and the daughter's like, why are you hitting on the girl? And I, I don't, I don't know who the main character is. I don't have any real attachment to any of these people. Um, and I've in none of these scenes am I ha- has any of my emotions been evoked. I'm not like, oh, I've, I, I felt in a certain way. And if the scenes aren't evoking an emotion, then that's a scene that's not landing. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right. So in terms of the conflict, I want to say that we probably got a murder mystery on our hands and that that's probably going to be what, where our story is. But if that's, but if we got a murder mystery, I'm like, well, why did we have the, what was with that Chinese myth? You know, so that part left me a little confused. <laughs> and, um, but it just in, in terms of like what I, what I want you to focus is I think you, you kind of rush the scenes and you don't provide me with like emotional hooks or triggers that will cause me to go, Oh wow. I, I had a feeling when, when a thing happened and uh, I would like to, to have more of that. So, yeah, I don't know if we really need the first time jump in the earlier stage where the people get gunned down or whatever until maybe later in the story when we're discussing, um, the, uh, chick's backstory or whatever yeah but yeah i think it's just kind of weird it should almost open with the detective right doing his investigation but and then uh, bring in the mysticism it. later so yeah you can give a detective like i didn't like is he even chinese Nope, no, I don't think so. A, yeah, no, he's, so he's racist. He's racist. Yes, he's, he's racist. racist. He's yeah. racist, and then he's, he's going to work with the Chinese girl, though, um, who was the daughter of the mob boss from earlier. I'm, that's what I figured. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I got that too. So, like, okay. um, 
John, what did you write this story to be about? Um, so basically, it's it's a it's a murder mystery. Um, the crime is a question. The, the 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 victim who's killed is the daughter of the former police captain who gave the order to kill Julia's father. Okay. So that's what okay. happened in the first part. So but that the first wasn't part the we meet for the audience in the first part. Okay. So in the so in the first part we have we meet Julia, we meet her father. They were smuggled into the US. It, it was at the time the United in the 1920s the United States was not allowing in Chinese immigrants. Yeah. So they were smuggled in by the Russians. They were escaping persecution because lots of shit was going on in China in that time, too. Um, that was right around the time when the communist revolution was occurring in China. So there's lots of things, bad things happening in China. And so the Russians basically smuggled them in. Um, the, the, the police, who are basically a gang with a badge, were basically just there to, you know... And maybe I can develop the conflict between the police and the Russian mobsters a little bit more, and maybe that'll give that scene some more weight. Um, but basically, they were had it in for each other for reasons unrelated to the main conflict of the story, which is why I don't really go into it. But the police, the gang with badges, show up and basically gun them all down. So the basic conflict that starts is that the police captain who gave the order to kill Julia's father, his daughter ends up murdered in Chinatown. The, and the, the the girl who's the Megan. Megan is Ju is Lang's daughter. Okay. okay. Julia. She's the Chinese girl that her father was reading the story, the children's okay. story yeah, to. Yeah. And she ends so, up dead. No. no, the police no. captain's daughter is dead. Characters we haven't been really introduced to yet. That hasn't know. happened yet, right? Yeah. We met okay. the police so captain. He there. gave the order to kill Julia's father. Oh, okay. So there was a corpse in Chinatown. It's just that there, I don't remember anyone saying that that was the captain's daughter. And then yeah. when well, the also, captain was there later, the captain didn't say, oh my God, someone killed my daughter. So well, I think... okay. So again, your first this pages, probably needs to be developed thought. better. Yeah, it's fifteen years apart. So the previous, <laughs> the, the police captain is no longer the captain. He's now the mayor of Los Angeles. Oh, okay. They make references to this is the mayor's daughter. Does the mayor know yet? Does Mayor Hayward know? And again, okay. if it's not, that's where I I might need to clear that up. So, so basically, based on your explanation right now, the plot is too complicated to start with. And you're not bringing your audience through um, at a ground level view I, into it. I, I can tell since I have to sit here and explain it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so that might be a direction yeah. to go to uh, help figure out your like how things are going to progress. Because either it's a procedural, it's it's a mystery, it's a murder mystery, or it's about someone who literally turns into a dragon. Or it's a very, very weird story about coming to America and having it be worse than the revolution you just left, which you're probably not telling, but that sounds like a really fun story. <laughs> Actually, so is someone turning into a dragon uh, in 1920 San Francisco. Hmm. So, um, I, I, yeah, okay. there's a lot and, going and it's on. It's not in San Francisco. They're in Los Angeles. She lied about that. So I guess that that might need to I might need to clarify that too, because she's not going to say, "Yeah, you were there when my father was murdered." Remember, fifteen years ago. I mean, he doesn't know who she is. A conflict in your buddy cop project. Right. Exactly. So it's um, right. He does. He. Uh, it's fifteen years later. He doesn't. He doesn't know her. He's. You know, like. I implied that he knew she was there in the warehouse and he let her go, but he hasn't seen her. He doesn't know what happened to her. So yeah, he has no idea that more questions for me. Um, 
Well, this is only the first 10 minutes, but um, yeah, well, I, mean, I, I do kind of understand. I do think I re- I, uh, would be established at the first 10 minutes, though, right? Like, yeah. who is the story about? Uh, which I'm pretty sure is Julia, but she's yes, not actually she's there the main for character. Most of it. And, yeah, and Lang just seems character. like a random uniform at the beginning, sends. Um, and yeah, there's just there's so much going on. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'm, I'm trying to try too hard to understand it. Um, no, it, but it's, it's, as I said, it's rough. Like, I, I, you do cut to something it. that is dramatic very regularly and quickly in all of your scenes. So like, once you have your through line, you've got like, okay pacing and good momentum. Mm-hmm. You, you still there, Danny? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just. Okay, yeah. yeah, no, I, I'm still there. I was like, you know, yeah, it's yeah. okay because good good I'm just, I don't know who we're supposed to care about. Yeah. Okay. I don't um, know. I just, I guess mm-hmm. my only thing is about doing throwing backstory later on in the story mm-hmm. um, whether how that's going to play or not mm-hmm. but actually oh. okay uh, but right. we're, like um, I mean I I guess a couple of years ago now, because the pandemic happened, like knives out. Like every time someone tells the story of what happened, they do it as a flashback, and it's still interesting every time, right? Oh, here's what really happened: a murder mystery to the audience. You were robotic. Uh, whenever everyone, you can get away with that here in a way that you might not be able to otherwise. And it's very possible that that story about someone becoming a dragon, because our default here is comics writer stream. I was like, someone's going to become a dragon. Right. And uh, nice misdirect there. But also, that's a it's a pretty drastic misdirect from someone's telling his child a bedtime story to actually he's doing it in a warehouse full of gags that's about to be attacked by the police. Like, there's too many additional layers in step two. Yeah. So, like, yeah. yeah. Like, you go from the third story to ground level really quickly. Mm. Okay. Anyway. All right. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right moving on. We got Primal Chaos. Okay, Larry, tell us about Primal Chaos. I am just moving forward writing, so this picks up from issue three, because it's issue four, of course, so uh, we left off with uh, Samuel somewhat winning his battle, but, you know, being left unconscious in a burning area, so that's that's generally where it left off, so that's where it picks up, so... (laughs) And we have yeah, uh, he, he beat Gabriel, right? Yeah, he beat Gabriel, but the other two get away. So okay. yeah, and um, but Gabriel's not dead, right? He's just like well, he's, he's an dead. angel, so he kind of right. just reverts back to his natural state. Of so. course, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was inside of a human body, though, so you know it's a little different. Uh, but, sorry, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what happens when angels get involved. People I die. Know. Yeah, people die. People die. Uh, so Farouk's going to come back in this issue because he ran away in the last issue. So that's where it's going to start. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He ran off like a little coward. He's a little bitch. Yeah. He is just a little guy. So, you know. All right. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's reading what? Uh, well, I can narrate. Okay. Uh, So we've got Farouk and Samuel. So whoever wants to take the two parts. Okay. Go at her. And I think there's a couple other parts, so we can just fill in from there. So. Okay. Okay. All right. So, we start with our opening caption on the front page. 
Uh, all right, so now remade with a whole body, Samuel steps forward into a new life. His resolve tested against mighty foes, he sets his mind on redemption. As Samuel evolves, chaos rejoices. Yeah. Page one. Back in, still in Boston, Massachusetts. Panel one. Wide shot from above looking down, Samuel is laid out on the ground of the parking lot behind the old hardware store. The fires that rage around him are glowing more intense and creeping closer to where he lay. Farouk calls out to Samuel from the street in front of the store, off panel. Samuel, where are you? Samuel! Panel 2. Close up on Samuel's face, his eyes shoot open. Panel 3. Wide shot facing Samuel. Samuel jumps to his feet. The fires have started to consume the surrounding buildings. Panel 4. Wide shot. View on the side of Farouk. Farouk stands as close as he can on the street near the old hardware store. The fire is raging in front of him as he screams towards the inferno. He grips Viviex's black cloak in his arms. Samuel, come on, big guy. You better not be dead. Panel 5, close up on Farouk's face as he screams out, tears forming in his eyes. Come on, man. Don't leave me here. Don't leave me here like she did. That yeah. bitch. <laughs> Page two, panel one. Captioned two nights ago after Sam. What? Uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> two nights ago after Samuel's arrival. Wide shot. Flames and rubble scattered through the city streets. A large hole where Samuel fell into the sewer from is seen in the background. Farouk surveys the destruction after Samuel's arrival. A look of panic on his face as he calls out looking for his sister. Arena, where are you? Come on to center me. Panel 2. Up, close up of Farouk looking towards the viewer. He freezes. A look of dread washes over his face as tears well in his eyes. This? <laughs> panel 3. Wide shot. Farouk in the right background side of the panel looks towards the left side of the panel's foreground. In the foreground, a right female leg sticks up in the air draped over a broken piece of concrete. She wears a silver chain link anklet bracelet around her ankle which i guess would be obvious with a heart shape on it the bracelet gleams in the light of the surrounding fires panel four wide shot from the side fruit falls to his knees in front of the body he holds his hands against his face and he weeps don't leave me here sis oh by the way john i, I just want to go um and the note where i was like i i usually don't get like an emotional charge out of your scenes one of the things you can do is you can you can like we're seeing here you can show me someone experiencing an emotion and perhaps mm. with some justification and then i'm gonna probably be drawn in and go oh wow so this is mm. uh, okay. all right page three splash page, page three splash page wide shot from above looking down farouk is on his knees orientated at the bottom of the panel facing towards the top of the panel the body of farouk's sister Arenia lays out before him on her back, crumpled over a broken chunk of concrete. Her right leg with the bracelet sticks up in the air, her dead eyes wide open with fear and old tears. A large gaping hole in her abdomen and chest lays open, blood pooling on the underside beside her. Farouk looks up at the sky, screaming, his arms in front of him. He calls out to God. Why, God? Why? Why her? Tell me why. Answer me. Page four, panel one, close up on Farouk's face, a voice yells at him off panel, and he head, turns his head right to address it. Uh, I'll do this one. Hey, kid, I'm a big guy, not the one you're calling to. Wide shot, the silhouette of the fat thug and skinny thug from issue one stand highlighted in the flames behind them, their eyes glowing red, their teeth oddly highlighted from beneath their crooked smiles. But I can still, I can I can still let you see your sister again. Panel three, close up, waist and shoulders of Farouk. The silhouette of the fat thug reaches towards Farouk. He quickly slides backwards to evade the unnatural reach. A look of panic on his face. Just give me a taste of that sweet soul. Panel four, close up on Farouk's face as he closes his eyes and screams at the fat fat thug. Get the fuck away from me! All right. Panel 5, or page 5, sorry. Panel 1. Farouk's point of view, Samuel stands over him, reaching down with his right arm, trying to help him up off the ground. Anybody wants to take that role? Farouk, are you alright? 
Panel 2. Side view. Farouk snaps back into reality, looking up towards Samuel with an embarrassed look on his face. Samuel, I'm fine. Never been better. Panel 3. Close up on Farouk as he looks and points in shock at Samuel's new left arm. Holy shit. Where'd you get that arm? Panel Where did you get that arm? Where did you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, pan and little four, wide shot from the side, Farouk reaches up and pokes Samuel's new left arm. Panel five, close up as the fleshy bits intertwine with the metal pulsate at Farouk's touch. Farouk lurches backwards away from it. Holy fuck, it moved. Page <laughs> six, panel one, wide shot from the side, Farouk looks up at Samuel with an awkward look on his face while rubbing the back of his head nervously. Uh, the balled-up cloak gripped in his other hand. Samuel looks down at his new arm and clenches his fist with it. I guess we both have a tale to tell. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Why <laughs> panel two? Best Why timing. shot? <laughs> Preston has the best timing. <laughs> yeah. Farouk stands up to his feet, looking slightly panicked at Samuel. Well, uh, we can catch up later on it. I think now is the perfect time to get you out of the city. People will be scared after all the explosions and weird shit happening two days in a row. We just have to avoid the police and other authorities. What then? Where will we hide? The enemy that tracked us here seems to have omnipresent vision. Panel three, close up on Farouk as he looks downward thinking to himself. That's very true. They found you and then me in no time flat, even though we tried to keep low. Panel 4, close up on Samuel as he looks down at Farouk with a look of concern. They found you too then? How did you escape? Close up on... Close up, Farouk <clears throat> looks off to the side avoiding the question. Like I said, we'll catch up later. Let's just say for now, it was weird and I still need to process it. Panel 6, shot from below looking up at Samuel's outstretched left hand. He looks down at it pensively. As do I. Page 7, panel 1, wide shot. Farouk smiles at Samuel at Samuel, and hands him the cloak from Viviex. You should put this on. It will hide you a bit from prying eyes. Even after all that insanity, I still managed to get you a disguise of sorts. Didn't even have to pay for it. Panel 2, wide shot. Samuel holds up the cloak and stretches it out in front of him, a concerned look on his face. Where did you get this? It feels wrong somehow to me. Uh, panel 3, close up. Farouk waves his finger at Samuel, giving him a stern look. No backstory till we are safe. You agreed. I can tell you it came from a friend. Is that good enough? Panel 4, wide shot. Samuel drapes the cloak over his back and starts to tie it around his neck. Very well. Panel 5. Wide shot from the side, Farouk and Samuel start to quickly walk away from the burning building. Samuel wears the cloak. The bottom only reaches his knees. Farouk rambles his plans as Samuel, or sorry, rambles his plans on as Samuel drifts into white noise, or as it drifts into white noise in Samuel's head. Sorry. Oh my God. Okay, <laughs> Can't read. I got a plan. See, it's going to be a long ass trip. We head north up the waterfront toward Old North Church, cross the bridge toward Bunker Hill. Try to cut west through Somerville and Belmont without being noticed, and then start heading off road toward. Panel six, close up to Samuel's face as he looks downward, thinking to himself. Why am I so connected to this boy? I was drawn to him in that sewer, and he seeks to find me, even though he fears me inside. I cannot shake this feeling of familiarity. Page eight. Okay, Larry. Larry, I have to ask. Yeah. Did, yeah. did you get your mapping and layout of Boston from Fallout 4? Uh, no, I looked at Google Earth. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Page 8, panel 1. Uh, <laughs> captioned a few hours later at the battle site in the marketplace. Wide shot. Gus Mueller stands with his back to the viewer, his hands clenched into fists as he looks out into the destruction from the fight with Hans and Viz Viviax. Uh, John, you can do Gus. So. You two fucked up big time. 
Panel two, wide shot. Gus's feet are seen from in the left foreground. In the background, Jen and Hans kneel on the ground, bowing toward him. You had one job. <laughs> Capture a human boy and an injured angel and do it without bringing too much attention to our secret fucking organization. Panel three. Close up on Gus's face as he closes his eyes and calmness washes over him. That being said, there was another angel in a power suit and the demon. So you aren't totally to blame. Panel four, wide shot from the side. Gus swings around, crossing his arms behind his back and looking down at the other two titans kneeling. I guess that means you two are off the hook. Wow, he's really forgiving. Pentax <laughs> is clearing up the other site. And we are getting the arm. What's he going to Exactly. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Do a Megatron or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Pentax is clearing the other site, and we are giving the armor to that creepy cyborg, Eric. Stand up, you two. We have work to do. Panel 5, watch shot. Fr front view, John, uh, Jen and Hans looking up, relieved, and shooting half-smiles at each other. Panel 6, close-up of Gus looking down, his eyes closed. He slips a half-smile. There's one more thing, though. I looked at the security footage, and Hans, buddy old pal... You could have grabbed the angel when you saved Jen. He was out for a good ten minutes. But you ran away instead. And now he's gone. So Hans Wanger, my good pal, Cirrus. Page 9, splash page. Wide shot, Gus has formed two long black metal spikes from his fist and he drives them into Hans' eyes. Purple energy explodes out from the impact point. Jen screams in the background. Gus grins maniacally as his eyes glow bright Now purple. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. There we see? go. You failed for the last time. There you go. Oh, <laughs> oh, page, <God>. 10. <laughs> page 10. Wide shot. Gus pulls out the spikes. Han starts to shrivel up and decay as purple energy leaks out from where his eyes were. Panel 2. Wide shot. Han's body starts to implode into a glowing ball of purple energy. Panel 3. Close up. Gus grabs the compressed ball of energy oh. in his hand. Panel four, close up. Gus opens his mouth wide oh. and throws the ball of energy in. Panel five, close up. Gus swallows the energy ball. The glow can be seen moving down his throat. Panel six, close up. Gus pounds his chest with his left hand and burps. John. <laughs> Excuse, me. Excuse me. There we there go. You go. There we go. I'll childish, <laughs> but okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked it. Um, we had cool villain doing execution mm -hmm. uh we certainly had some emotional involvement there with farouk yeah. and then uh we had we had some samael showing mm -hmm. up didn't do a bunch <laughs> but he she showed up and he was like yeah. hey what was the fuss so um i i i i, I like it <laughs> thank you uh john what do you think um so it had some really cool visuals in the beginning. Um, I, I like the, 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 the way you did the very minimalist on the dialogue and the narration and just let the, the art kind of tell the story. Um, so I'm a fan of that in visual mediums. Um, so I think you had some really, really cool emotive uh, art pages in the beginning. And um, I, I liked the, the, the execution death scene was very, very cool and had some really interesting visuals. Um, you know, they're magical, super magical powered beings. And, you know, they're not just going to, you know, take a baseball bat to somebody's head. So, uh, so that was cool. Okay. Um, so I, I really liked that there was this strong emotional involvement with Farouk and as we open it's like really him at ground level dealing with threats of his level that was really cool the execution was totally villainous sort of neat uh we finally got some kind of introspection on Samael's part so he's not just a very serious voice being angelic <laughs> which was a nice change of pace and uh yeah something happened cool cool uh 
All right. Uh, constructives. Who wants to go? I'll go. Oh, sorry. Um, oh. All right. Whatever. So the dialogue needs work. Yeah. Like, especially in this section, like, it's okay for Farouk to be really stereotypical in the dialogue when he's distraught. Um, but like, Samael sounded really wooden and robotic, and Farouk did for a lot of that scene, too. Um, and then I just had sort of a plotting question. Weren't there two demons attacking him, and then Samael just shows up, and the demons are just sort of still there while they have a conversation? That was confusing. Um, and it wouldn't be nice to see Farouk do something on his own anyways, because I think the only sections of... I mean, I haven't been around for all of this story, but there's a lot of, Farouk is in trouble. Samael yeah. saves him. Farouk is in trouble talking to Samael, who runs off and fights someone completely unrelated. So I was sort of excited for a bit to see Farouk like, rise to a challenge, but I never got to see that. Okay. That was it. Okay. Um, so I was a little confused when he was Farouk was going through the city because then he started talking to his sister and then like Samuel showed up and then sister's completely forgotten. And yeah. I'm like, wait, wasn't he just crying over his sister's dead body? And now it's like, oh, Samuel is here. All is right it, with the world. It was a flashback. <laughs> okay. That yeah. was completely lost on me. Um, I thought he was going to look for Samuel and then decided to look for his and then found his sister's dead body and then was crying, and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. Samuel showed up, and he didn't care about his dead sister anymore. So, um, the other, th- the other thing is, I really, I felt like for ten pages, I didn't really feel like a lot happened. Um, and I mean, I guess story wise, like. Farouk went and looked for Samael. Samael showed up. They chatted. They went for a walk. And then, you know, the, the, the supervillain scene, that was pretty cool. And I felt like, you know, like we're raising stakes here and all of that. Um, but I just kind of felt like, I don't know, maybe it just... Maybe because I got confused with the sister thing. But I just kind of felt like nothing really of important happened. Um, story-wise, I guess. Yeah, I was really confused by that, too. Like, Farouk goes from cursing God to, like, hey, buddy, what's up? Yeah. <laughs> really uh, and, and this is in a context where, like, there it's, for some reason, they're always hanging out in a goddamn alley. I don't know what's up with that. Uh, again, I might just be missing steps. So I, that's, I only ever see Farouk when he's in these the same damn alley every time. <laughs> he does um, hang out in alleys a lot. So that was sort of weird. And I didn't understand why he had Viviax's cloak. And I thought he was in love with Viviax. And he was talking about that. I was like, oh, you want to know how I got it? And like, yeah. So um, certainly... When you're dealing with a story of this scale with all of this cosmic level terror, it's nice to see a human reaction. Farouk had a good one. And you let, you might have let that go a little bit too early. And it would have been interesting to see him force Samael to deal with these earthly consequences. Hmm. And also, why does Samael need to be hidden from the authorities? I'm just, there was a lot that was confusing. And I don't really understand why the two of them need each other. I, I do wonder that one myself. Uh, well, what is the what is the link between those two? I mean, did Samael also hang out in that alley all the time? And they're just only incidentally meeting yeah. each other regularly, right? Like, do they both have apartments that just back into it? Is that what's going on? Well, I mean, I know in issue one, Samael saved Farouk from being harassed by some bullies, which turned out to be demons in surprise, in disguise. Yes. But besides that, I don't – like, why I don't understand why they're still hanging out together. Like, did they have, like, a bromance moment or something that I missed? 
that Dallar just like thick as thieves or I I, I guess I don't <laughs> uh, um, I mean the answers are in the visuals at the beginning but I'm not going to discuss it till later on in the plot so yeah <laughs> it, is it going to be at least in this issue yeah okay so that justifies Samael's monologue about Farouk somewhat yeah yeah so it sounds like you're going in the right direction there, but it, it could be made more obvious throughout. I mean, this is issue four, right? Like, why do they need each other? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is issue four, and I have no idea why they're still hanging out together four well, issues in. And I'll remind the... you, we said this about Jaws, two protagonists for many, many, many issues of DC. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> right, but, <laughs> but again, I, I had a very specific reason, which was yeah. baked into the plot, why they had to be stuck together. And well, that was kind of the point. But yeah. I don't see anything like that in here. To you time know, line, kind of yeah. like... Timeline-wise, it's only really been like one day since they met each other, so... I mean, so if if I met a strange dude in an alley and a bunch of shit happened around this strange guy, I'd get the fuck away, and I wouldn't go back. <laughs> there was a lot of conversation that. about that in the first issue, so yeah. and the second issue. So, I mean, the yeah. new arm thing in the space of like how many hours is like, hey, buddy's bad news. Yeah, but you also have to keep in mind this is not a film where you get that sense that everything is happening in the moment, and it we basically get a day night cycle where we wow. realize okay this whole thing takes place within a 24 hour period this yeah. is a comic book that's going to be five issues that's, that's going to have several months in yeah. between each issue so i don't know if your audience is going to quite grasp that these scenes are immediately following the next i mean that's what the captions are for right Oh, so. please include the captions in your rewrite also. They're, they're there. They're, they're already okay. there. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, like your caption about the whatever in the market square or whatever was yeah. deeply unhelpful. Okay. Uh, like, here's where we are. Here's when we are at best. You know, like Boston or this part of Boston, the past or yeah. whatever. That's oh, all you here, really here, need. Not here, like two hours I... later at, around the corner. Or just do a clock. Okay. If, if the whole thing takes place, let's say, in 24 to 48 hours, just do a clock. I, I, I mean, you do don't a necessarily clock. have Very to... Very clearly, yeah. Right, right. So you just pick the... So, like, you just say, this happens at 7 a.m. And then later on, we say this is now 8 a.m. Or let's say it's going to happen at night. So it's 7 p.m. And then later at 8 p.m. So and then at the end of issue one or the end of well, I know issue one's already gone to print, but basically then at the no, end of your like... issue, you can say it's, you know, it that issue one ends at 1 a.m. And then the, the next issue can start. We are in Boston. It's 1 a.m. in the morning. So when they yeah, pick up, that's a really good pick idea. up issue two, they remember the clock at the end of issue one that said it's 1 a.m. And now it's 1 a.m. And it get, it'll it'll help create the idea that this is all happening all it's, you know. And then of course, and then you, if you collect it in a trade, also it's going to read really well. Hmm. That's a really good idea, John. And then when when you're done all your issues and you do your trade paperback and you do the whole thing as one graphic novel, then you can get rid of the clock because nobody will notice because nobody's going to stop at them. It, it's really just a way to for for the issues wise. So, just a thought. Okay. All right. Lords of Iron. Narrating. Okay. I'm getting some more tea, and hopefully there's no spiders in it. Yeah, all right. Uh, there's uh, no obvious spiders in it. I mean, the tea is your yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, since he's getting tea, I guess, oh, right, well, hold on. I, 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 I live in a studio. Away. I'm fine. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Okay. My headset's wireless, so I'm good. Yeah, we're going to leave our question. Uh, well, let's see. We're, we left off on page 10, I think, last time, right? Page uh, 10. because we we're doing a rewrite. See. Yeah. Uh, Lilia sits, yeah, Lilia sits slumped, uh, 
Yeah, you know, she she literally was looking at this the this burn she got from that uh, guy she took out, and you, you guys saw that last time, remember? Hmm. Lily had a flashback that she killed a, a guy. If you don't remember, oh. Lily had a flashback when that she killed a guy. Caught you came and was like, "Hey, you need help stowing your gear because we're about to launch." And there was, they was like, "No, no, no, it's fine." And you know, there was some distance there, and Lilia shuts Katya out and is left alone with her flashback and and the scar of when she previously killed someone uh, with her plasma bayonet. From which point we continue to page eleven, panel yes. one. There we go. On the bridge of the Yak Three. Baranov sits in his command chair. Sergei in navigation. Nikolai, a short, rugged Russian in his mid 20s, sits at weapons while Katya sits at the operations console. All wear flight suits and are strapped into their chairs. John, you can do all the electronic voices. Aw. Oh, okay. Danny, you can do all the electronic. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. All right. J John, I, you, you can have do have a bunch of speaking roles. I in do. This yes, I so do. Let's, yeah. yeah, let's save John for the real characters. Okay. All right. Yak three transport widowmaker stand by for undocking and launch. John, you can be barren off. Better Orkroff, release the docking clamp. Affirmative Alpha. Attention stellar warriors, secure for launch. Panel two. Wearing her armored personnel suit. Uh or personal suit. Uh now uh <laughs> Lilia takes position in a bulkhead cubby designed to hold her in place during G4 stress. Panel three. The Yak-3 begins to fall away from the planetoid as the docking arm decouples from the ship. Ship decoupled. Panel 4. The Yak-3 spins on maneuvering thrusters to align itself with the maglev trench. Better Evanoff, position the ship for launch and activate the electromagnetic panels. Panel 5. The ship sits above the maglev trench. Time lapse shows the rails widening to accommodate the large vessel. Affirmative Alpha, ship in position, panels activated, automated launch sequence engaged. Panel 6. The Yak-3 sits in the now wider bag lab at the base of the smelting facility that will accelerate it rapidly around the planetoid's equator. Launch sequence initiated. You like those electronic voices. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to just go nasal, and yeah. I'm kind of tired, so yeah. yeah. Also, genuinely, like I just read this before the stream started, yeah. and I know there's a ton of character roles. Yeah. Uh, page twelve, panel one. Lilia positions her helmet such that the fins come off that come off of either side slide into the slotted grooves in the bulkhead, so as to lock her head into position. Brace for three G acceleration. Panel two, small close up on one of the fins locks into place. Click. Panel three. The ship speeds down the maglev track. Launch. Panel four. From a distance, the Act three reaches the halfway point on the far side of Ceres. Approaching the far side of Ceres at mission time T plus two two one seconds. Ship velocity six point six kilometers per second. Panel five. Speed lines show the transport vaulting off of the maglev ramp and into open space boosted by the power of the Yak-3's own engine. Exit velocity, 9.4 kilometers per second, achieved at mission time T plus 313 second. Good hunting, Widowmaker. Page 13, panel one, large panel. Each wearing their APS, Katya, Lilia, Sergei, Baranov, and each of the other stellar warriors, the number of which we still don't know, stand before their hulking space combat nets, that house the reactor, thrusters, and space weapons. All right, warriors. We have got more than just our lives riding on this SP unit A18. This is Alpha Knight Alexei Baronov of the OEC Space Force. Begin activation sequence. SP unit responding. Panel two. In the foreground, Catch's helmet bears two insignias, one for the unit and the Christian Crescent. <laughs> A combination of the Christian cross and Muslim crescent, which identifies her position as yeah. chaplain. She climbs the built-in stairs, currently extended, that lead to the cockpit of the mech. 
the background, Lilia similarly climbs into her mech. Fission reactor activated. Panel three. Sitting towards the front of the chair inside the cockpit with the canopy still open to the outside, Katja connects her APS armor to a large electricity and data port. Behind her, a port sit waiting to connect to the fins on her helmet and another lower port to connect around her waist. Click. Panel four. Katja sit back in the seat and the fins on her helmet lock into place. Time lapse shows the canopy beginning to lower to lock her inside the mech. Click. VR interface engaged. Panel five. Katja gazes upon her teammates in the other FP-27 suits who stand at their stations in the hangar. Each pilot's face is show as a small inset panel over the canopy of their mech. May the lords of heaven bestow victory upon us. Ura! Yeah. Page 14, panel one. Pilot aviators now occupy all 15 of the mecha standing in the hangar. Uh, 15, we know 15, there we go. We possess be no good better should, combat yeah. capabilities yeah. of their latest weapon. So we're just going to focus on fundamentals, coordinated triangulations of fire. Panel two, a star field against the blackness of space begins to superimpose over the hangar as the Legion of Warriors listens to Alpha Knight Baranov. Engagement range for this simulation will be 30 kilometers. Hurrah, warriors, begin. Panel three, on the distant capital H horizon for some reason, the numbered computer brackets incoming targets with a red box, with red boxes. In the background, the other armor clad warriors take up position. In the foreground, Sergei and Lilia take flight, each training their guns on the target. We're assigned target six, wait Lily, let's make this happen. Panel four, in the foreground, Lilia flies seemingly lying down as the top of her head pointing in the direction of thrust. She faces the target and trains her guns to hit it many kilometers away. In the background, Sergei taking aim at the same target flies in exactly the opposite direction. Other members of the Legion perform similar maneuvers in pairs. Who's Lilia? Larry. <clears throat> Six seconds to firing solution. Panel five, Lilia point of view. A HUD display shows red crosshairs on the distant target. Other targets highlighted with red targets fly alongside. One graphic shows a triangulation of the target with Sergey flying in the opposite direction, putting the target in a crossfire with a second time that reads 2.1 seconds. Two seconds. Panel six. Lilia opens fire to both cannons as she changes course and heads towards the target. Fire and approach. Page 15. Panel one, Lilia flies towards her target, guns blazing. Frap! Panel two, the targeted Bioroid sees a distant Lilia approaching and moves to dodge her bullets, streaming his way. Rounds from Sergei, firing at a different angle, are also streaming towards him. Slippery bastard. Panel three, the Bioroid dodges out of the way of Lilia's scream, but Sergei's scream catches him in the center of mass. I got him! Panel four, Riddled with bullets from both directions, large bloody pieces of the bioroid shear off the now dead target. Bam! Panel five. Sergey looks at the destroyed bioroid on his HUD. Ha ah, Scratch one! Page 16. Panel one. Katya flies through space in her mech, firing at a distant target. She's got dead in her sights. Brap! Panel two. Point of view through Katya's sights. The uranium rounds and a missile stream towards her as the target dodges and returns fire. Taking fire. Panel three. A distant Baranov has a clean shot at the Bioroid in the foreground coming after Katya. I got him. All right, Warriors. Simulation over. Let's see how we did. Panel four. Baranov stands before the other stellar warriors, all in their mechs and seen through inset faces on their canopies. New kill icons materialize on Lilia, Baranov, Sergei, and a couple of other warriors. Some of us got some kills. More importantly, we worked as a team and protected each other. Panel 5. Foreground. Katya's face acknowledges the criticism that Baranov 
distance provides. Others are going to need a bit more work on their accuracy and how to stay out of trouble spots. Yes, Alpha. Warriors, we have 30 more hours to get this right. I want five more sorties before meal break. Computer, reset the simulation. Beginning. Page 17. Panel 1. Katya sits with Lilia in the mess hall, eating formless rations off of metal plates. You scored a lot of simulated kills. I became the triple ace of training drills. I have always known that you are God's divine instrument. Panel 2. Lilia rolls her eyes. His will be done. The all-powerful human god we never see versus the quite we real... It should be we never see, sorry. Yeah. Oh, we never see versus the quite real power of Trinity. Okay. Panel 3. Katja takes the opportunity to bolster morale. The Vs exist as little more than empty vessels for her evil consequences. Humans have free will and the power of our beliefs. Let us not give in to worry, for he created the heavens and earth in truth and formed you and perfected your forms, and to him is the final decision. Panel 4. Standing, Baranov places his hand on Katya's sol uh, shoulder, who remains seated at the mess hall table. Sounds like time for Chaplin to give us our pre-combat blessing. Absolutely. Panel 5. Still seated at the table, Lilia wants to duck out, but Baranov, who remains standing with his hand on Katya's shoulder, will have none of it. I would prefer to get more simulator time. Attendance at unit exercise is mandatory, Delta Danovich. Page 18, panel 1. Dressed in a black flowing robe with an epitrachelion showing the Christian crescent, Katya stands in front of a podium occupied by a holy text and a small bowl on an elevated platform before the other warriors who sit in attendance in the mess hall. The Lords of Heaven bless you in the name of God, the Almighty, his son Jesus, and Muhammad, his prophet. Peace be upon them. Panel 2. Katja's face shows serenity as she speaks to the congregation. As scripture tells us, though I walk through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. God will not allow the human spark to be erased, for we were made at his hand. Let us now come together and receive his blessings. Panel 3. Holding the small bowl in her hands, Katja stands on the floor in front of them, where the other warriors have formed a line headed by Baranov, Sergei, and Lilia. Just as iron allows our blood to function, so is it the testament of human faith and determination. Panel four, Katya dips her index and middle finger into a bowl of rust flakes mixed with water. Sacrifices made in this world. Panel five, Katya traces the Christian crescent on the forehead of Baranov. Shall be rewarded in the next. I shall not fear death. Page 19. Panel 1. Catches Mark still upon his forehead. Baranov stands as a Mecha Knight, giving a pep talk to his legion, all bearing a similar mark, immediately before a launch out of the bay, in which he stands with the rest of his crew. All right, warriors. This time, it's for real. We either be victorious or dead in the next few minutes. Let's do this right. Panel 2. Small headshot panel. The hatch opens onto space, and Baranov points the way. Let's go. Panel 3, small headshot. God is great. Panel 4, small headshot. Larry. Ooh, ah. oh, too late. Where is Larry? <laughs> too late. Yeah, too late. <laughs> Panel 5, Lilia and Sergei fly out together, looking at the distant targets outlined with red boxes. We kill, we kill. Sorry. Ah. target to commence. Sorry. Page 20, panel 1. Her two over-the-shoulder cannons train on a distant target as she flies in the opposite direction as Sergei. And by her, of course, we mean Lilia? Uh, yes, it should be Lilia. You're right. Right on target, 21 kilometers. Panel 2, inset in 1. Lilia's HUD locks in on a single approaching target. The crossfire counter shows her in close proximity to Sergei and needing 6 seconds to achieve a firing solution. 6 seconds, Sergei. Let's hold this together. Panel 3. Lilia applies opposite of Sergei. Trading her guns on the distant target, incoming streams of bullets target them from the approaching enemy bioroids. Taking fire. Panel 4. Lilia's mecha dances away from the 
depleted uranium rounds as her thrusters take her to safety. Had to veer off, Sergey. Panel 5. Lilia turns back towards the enemy. Returning to course, comrade. Panel 6. On Lilia's HUD, her crossfire meter shows a black mark through her partner's icon. Lhasa partner pair detected. Sergey. No! <laughs> hmm. Page 21. Panel 1. Lilia looks over to see her partner floating in space, his armor riddled with bullets. Bozumoy. Attention, warriors. Panel 2. The reflection of a BT-100 bioroid draws closer on Baranov's visor. Baranov's reaction betrays his concern. We're facing heavy losses. Panel 3. The BT-100 fires a single explosive frag missile towards Baranov. Lay down suppressing fire and fall back to the transport. Panel 4. The missile fragments into darts of depleted uranium racing towards Baranov. Oh, wow. Page 22, panel 1. Darts of depleted uranium fly through Baranov's suit. Blood flies as one penetrates his visor and face. Ah. Panel 2. Lilia's battle suit takes a hold of the shattered remains of Sergei's and prepares to tow her dead companion back to the ship. FP-27 requests permission to signal surrender on open channel. Panel 3. Lilia flies towards the transport, dragging the hulking remains of Sergei behind her by her left hand. FP-27 concurs. Surrender message commencing. Tension all combatants. Article 2 of the Treaty of Daimos. All combatants are ordered to cease engagement and allow for orderly surrender and retreat of defending force. Have a nice day. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> Uh, panel yeah. 4. With Sergei in tow, Lilia's pod approaches the Yak-3 transport. His rear hatch hangs open for the warriors to return. Delta Knight Denovich reporting. Surrender signal has been issued. All units respond with status and location. Panel 5. Lilia looks out into the field of distance stars. A few asteroids dot the horizon. Did anyone else survive? All right. Is that the end of issue one? That's the end of issue one. Mm. Mm. Much better. Um, I, I like the. Ch I'm. I, I really dig the changes that you made. Um, I, I think spending time with the characters before they before you kill them all off. Um, I think was a good move. Um, I like ending the issue this way. I think it's a really good. Uh, emotionally impactful way to end issue one, and um, yeah, I think think all around, this is this is pretty strong. Well, thanks. All right, Larry, what do you think? Uh, I like these ten pages better than the first ten pages. But <laughs> uh, you, 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 you didn't like Trinity? No, I, I liked it. It's just uh, I don't know. Like I was a little disconnected or something that day maybe i just didn't okay. take it all in Fair but enough. i definitely like the robot combat sections of the book better so yeah um dialogue was good it had a lot of your previous script in it so i like that one so i don't really have much to add i just it's generally cleaned up very well so yeah it works really well <laughs> Uh, so, in disclosure, I read a I read this exact version of the script yeah. earlier today, and, and he made already a lot of left a bunch of notes. Yeah, and already made a bunch of changes in some of the dialogue. Um, I like this. Um, I like that you kept the weird Earth religion. I like that you do a lot to establish like the rankings of the knights, and you integrate that with the the new content that's sort of establishing an existing relationship with Katya and Lily. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like that Lily's loss at the end really lands. Um, there's a much better explanation of how and why the bioroids are a threat and what the point is of the exercises. 
So we know that they're practicing something in specific and we can actually see it on their HUDs. Mm -hmm. So um, unlike a lot of the, um, the Trinity shenanigans, it's really easy to understand what the hell's going on here. Um, and the Bioroids just sort of arrive and wipe the floor. So that moves the plot along to where you want to actually start the real story. Awesome. All right. Um, constructive or anyone? Shotgun kind of going last. Yeah, exactly. Um, not really. I, I know I had, I mean, this is probably the third or fourth time mm. you presented this section. Mm. Um, so I, I can definitely see that the work that you put into it. Um, I think I think it just I don't know I Larry not really all right cool yeah I mean kind of in the same boat I've heard it presented right, cool. many times over in different versions yeah but uh, no I think you've taken some really good leaps to improve on what we've talked about before so I don't really see any issues I could add constructively to it to improve no, it. So, no, no, no comments on the uh, launch sequence. No. No. Nah. I mean, well, like, I mean, I'm just saying, no one, no one has has put one in. Oh. I. I what I'm saying. What, what did you guys think of it? Is what I mean. Like, did you guys like it? The, the launch oh. sequence. What do you mean? Um, I mean you know, when, when when the ship travels around Ceres. Oh. When, when, when they launched the Act 3 into space, I thought that was cool. But all right, no one, no one Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> it probably just didn't translate to text as well yeah. as it probably will on... Uh, okay. On, I, I think, uh, I think when it's drawn, you'll like it. But yeah, you know, like, I, I, had the, I have this maglev track going all the way around the planetoid. Okay. And, yeah. and you know, the, and the ship is being kind of drawn around that at, at 3 Gs of acceleration. And then, you know, the computer voice is telling you it's traveling at, like, 9 kilometers a second exit velocity and stuff. Right, right. Yeah. All right, no one cares. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, Danny. Um, so, in terms of the exit sequence, uh, I'm no, I'm confident that the time lapse art direction you give a couple times is going mm -hmm. to work, but um, it's a little bit clunky as art direction still. I don't know if there's a better way to do something like this um, that doesn't show that doesn't try to show movement in a panel like mm -hmm. in multiple directions, because that could be confusing. Okay. It might not be. I'm, I'm, it's not a direction I tend to give in comics, so... Well, you, this one, there's so many times where, like, I have to show the, the direction something is moving. Yeah. Like, like, like when the ships are flying stern first, I'm um, like, well, I gotta show that it's going that way. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this was direction uh, for everyone else in uh, the new version of the first ten pages. Right. Uh, that I gave a particular note of. How do you draw that? <laughs> um, but like, so this story is good. Um, what I'm really concerned about that we've lost from the previous version is as much time with the the human cast. Mm -hmm. Um. We make up for quite a lot by having uh, Lilia and Katya already have a relationship and by how we establish Baranov in the version that uh, John and Larry haven't seen because that was no that you implemented after last week. Mm -hmm. um, but that's good. Um, with Sergei and everybody else, it's still really hard to tell them apart. And the, uh, the scene with the Bioroid attack is like two pages in like 20 panels. And it's, it's over very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, for all the time that you spend in pornographic depictions of a foundry and a maglev track, um, it would be nice to spend a similar amount of time showing off these mechs and what they can do. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably have and, to add another I mean, couple pages. Yeah, like I suggested in what I wrote to you earlier today, like I right. think actually having the same number of panels in twice as many pages and just going to 24 might be a good solution there because mm -hmm. like this is your big climactic deeply impactful action scene 
Like this is the whole story is what happens after this. Mm -hmm. And that, that means that's the scene that you've got to really linger on. I think to make the loss work, like to, to make the loss feel even more like loss, to make the hits feel impactful, to make the human's failure be um, inevitable right? Like there was no way they were going to win. Like that really needs to come out in the art. And uh, that means we need to see every hit and see every blood droplet, mm -hmm. uh, see every counterattack fail, all of that. Um, and in a way that surrender at the end um, fundamentally needs to be the thing that saves Lily's life. It is, but it's, it's not going to be emotionally impactful if we're going through this scene so quickly. Okay. All right, cool. I'll get to work on that one. All right, folks. Well, those were all the scripts we had today. All right. All right. Next week, then. I am super excited to see next week when John brings us um, more of the Dragon Warrior and Can't wait. The yeah. gang. Yeah. Please. Man. All right. Yeah. Are you gonna keep I, on it's it? going to be short because they said it's only six pages unless I come up with something else. Well, you can come up with but, stuff. Uh, I mean, come and, up with and, and, and in general, like I said, John, you, you, you tend to rush your scenes. So if you just slow your scenes down, your six pages will probably become 10 pages. Yeah, like that 16 pages that you wrote mm. could just be the first chapter. There's enough story there. And I want this person to investigate this murder with me is uh, should is a pretty good hook for like, well, what happens next? Okay. So maybe that's the way. All right. I'll see everybody next week. All right. All right. See ya. See you next week, guys. Bye. Yeah. Bye, see Big ya. Steve. <laughs>